This is The End of the World as We Know It by Dale Bailey. Between 1347 and 1450 A.D., bubonic plague overran Europe, killing some 75 million people. The plague, dubbed the Black Death because of the black pustules that erupted on the skin of the afflicted, was caused by a bacterium now known as Yersinia pestis. The Europeans of the day, lacking access to microscopes or knowledge of disease vectors, attributed their misfortune to an angry god. Flagellants roamed the land, hoping to appease his wrath. They died by the hundreds, both day and night, Agnola de Tura tells us. I buried my five children with my own hands. So many died that all believed it was the end of the world. Today, the population of Europe is about 729 million. Evenings, Wyndham likes to sit on the porch, drinking. He likes gin, but he'll drink anything. He's not particular. Lately, he's been watching it get dark. Really watching it. I mean, not just sitting there. So far, he's concluded that the cliché is wrong. Night doesn't fall. It's more complex than that. Not that he's entirely confident in the accuracy of his observations. It's high summer just now, and Wyndham often begins drinking at 2 or 3, so by the time the sun sets around 9, he's usually pretty drunk. Still, it seems to him that, if anything, night rises, gathering from, its, it, from in inky pools or under the trees, as if it has leached up from underground reservoirs, and then spreading out toward the borders of the yard and up toward the yet lighted sky. It's only towards the end that anything falls, the blackness of deep space, he supposes, unscrolling from high above the earth. The two planes of darkness meet somewhere in the middle, and that's night for you. That's his current theory, anyway. It isn't his porch, incidentally, but then it isn't his gin, either, except in the sense that, insofar as Wyndham can tell, anyway, everything now belongs to him. End of the world stories usually come in one of two varieties. <clears throat> in the first, the world ends with a natural disaster, either unprecedented or on an unprecedented scale. Flood leads all of the contenders. God himself, we're told, is fond of that one, though plagues have their advocates. A renewed ice age is also popular. Ditto, drought. In the second variety, irresponsible human beings bring it on themselves. Mad scientists and corrupt bureaucrats, usually. An exchange of ICBMs is the typical route although the scenario has dated in the present geopolitical environment. Feel free to mix and match. Genetically engineered flu virus, anyone? Melting polar ice caps? On the day the world ended, Wyndham didn't even realize it was the end of the world, not right away anyway. For him, at that point in his life, pretty much every day seemed like the end of the world. This was not a consequence of a chemical imbalance either. It was a consequence of working for UPS, where on the day the world ended, Wyndham had been employed for 16 years, first as a loader, then in sorting, finally in the coveted position of driver, the brown uniform and everything. By this time, the company had gone public and it also owned some shares. The money was good, very good, in fact. Not only that, he liked his job. Still, the beginning of every goddamn day started off feeling like a cataclysm. You try getting up at 4 a.m. every morning and see how you feel. This was his routine. At 4 a.m., the alarm went off, an old-fashioned alarm. He wound it up every night. He couldn't tolerate the radio before he drank his coffee. He always turned it off right away, not wanting to wake his wife. He showered in the spare bathroom, again not wanting to wake his wife. Her name was Anne. He poured coffee into his thermos and ate something he probably shouldn't, a bagel, a Pop-Tart, while he stood over the sink. By then it would be 4.20, 4.25 if he was running late. Then he would do something paradoxical. He would go back to his bedroom and wake up the wife he'd spent the last 20 minutes trying not to disturb. Have a good day, Wyndham always said. His wife always did the same thing too. She would screw her face into her pillow and smile. Hmm, she would say. It was usually such a, usually such a cozy, loving, early morning, cuddling kind of mmm. It almost made getting up at four in the goddamn morning worth it. Wyndham heard about the World Trade Center, not the end of the world, though to Wyndham it sure as hell felt that way, from one of his customers. The customer, her name was Monica, was one of Wyndham's regulars. Home shopping network fiend, this woman. She was big, too. The kind of woman with whom people say she has a nice personality or she has such a pretty face. She did have a nice personality, too. At least Wyndham thought she did. So he was concerned when she opened the door in tears. 
What's wrong, he said. Monica shook her head at a loss for words. She waved him inside. Wyndham, in violation of about 50 UPS regulations, stepped in after her. The house smelled of sausage and floral air freshener. There was home shopping network shit everywhere. I mean, everywhere. Wyndham hardly noticed. His gaze was fixed on the television. It was showing an airliner flying into the World Trade Center. He stood there and watched it from three or four different angles before he noticed the Home Shopping Network logo in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. That was when he concluded that it must be the end of the world. He couldn't imagine the Home Shopping Network preempting regularly scheduled programming for anything less. The Muslim extremists who flew airplanes into the World Trade Center, into the Pentagon, into the unyielding earth of an otherwise unremarkable field in Pennsylvania, were secure, we are told, in the knowledge of their imminent translation into paradise. There were 19 of them. Every one of them had a name. Wyndham's wife was something of a reader. She liked to read in bed. Before she went to sleep, she always marked her spot using a bookmark Wyndham had given her for her birthday one year. It was a cardboard bookmark with a yarn ribbon at the top and a picture of a rainbow arching high over white-capped mountains. Smile, the bookmark said. God loves you. Wyndham wasn't much of a reader, but if he'd picked up his wife's book the day the world ended, he would have found the first few pages interesting. In the opening chapter, God raptures all true Christians to heaven. This includes true Christians who are driving cars and trains and airplanes, resulting in uncounted lost lives as well as significant damage to personal property. If Wyndham had read the book, he'd have thought of a bumper sticker he sometimes saw from high on his UPS truck. Warning, the bumper sticker read, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. Whenever he saw that bumper sticker, Wyndham imagined cars crashing, planes falling from the sky, patients abandoned on their operating table, pretty much the scenario of his wife's book, in fact. Wyndham went to church every Sunday, but he couldn't help wondering what would happen to the untold millions of people who weren't true Christians, whether by choice or by the geographical fluke of having been born in some place like Indonesia. What if they were crossing the street in front of one of those cars, he wondered, watering lawns those planes would soon plow into. But I was saying, on the day the world ended, Wyndham didn't understand right away what had happened. His alarm clock went off the way it always did, and he went through his normal routine. Shower in the spare bath, coffee in the thermos, breakfast over the sink, chocolate donut this time and gone a little stale. Then he went back to the bedroom to say goodbye to his wife. Have a good day, he said, as he always said. Leaning over, he shook her a little not enough to really wake her, just enough to get her stirring. In 16 years of performing this ritual, minus federal holidays and two weeks of paid vacation in the summer, Wyndham had pretty much mastered it. He would cause her to stir without quite waking her up just about every time. So, to say he was surprised when his wife didn't screw her face into her pillow and smile is something of an understatement. He was shocked, actually. Uh, and there was an additional consideration. She hadn't said, mmm, either. The air conditioning cycled off. For the first time, Wyndham noticed a strange smell, faint organic funk like spoiled milk or unwashed feet. Standing there in the dark, Wyndham began to have a very bad feeling. It was a different kind of bad feeling than the one he'd had in Monica's living room watching airliners plunge again and again into the World Trade Center. That had been a powerful but largely impersonal bad feeling. I say largely impersonal because Wyndham had a third cousin who worked at Cantor Fed Fitzgerald. The cousin's name was Chris. Wyndham had to look it up in his address book every year when he sent out cards celebrating the birth of his personal savior. The bad feeling he began to have when his wife failed to say, mm, on the other hand, was powerful and personal. Concerned, Wyndham reached down and touched his wife's face. It was like touching a woman made of wax, lifeless and cool. It was at that moment, that moment precisely, that Wyndham realized the world had come to an end. Everything after that was just details. Beyond the mad scientist and corrupt bureaucrats, characters and end-of-the-world stories typically come in one of three varieties. The first is the rugged individualist. You know the type. Self-reliant, iconoclastic loners who, who know how to use firearms and deliver babies. By story's end, they're well on their way to re-establishing Western civilization, but they're usually smart enough not to return to the bad old ways. The second variety is the post-apocalyptic bandit. These characters often come in gangs, they face off against the rugged survivor types. If you happen to prefer cinematic incarnations of the end of the world tale, you could usually recognize them by their penchant for bondage gear, punked out haircuts, and customized vehicles. 
Unlike the rugged survivors, the post-apocalyptic bandits embrace the bad old ways, though they're not displeased by the expanding opportunities to rape and pillage. The third type of character, also pretty common, though a good deal less so than the other two, is the world very sophisticated. Like Wyndham, such characters drink too much. Unlike Wyndham, they suffer badly from ennui. Wyndham suffers too, of course. Whatever he suffers from, you can bet it's not ennui. We were discussing details, though. <clears throat> Wyndham did the things people do whenever they discover a loved one dead. He picked up the phone and dialed 911. There seemed to be something wrong with the line, however. No one picked up on the other end. Wyndham took a deep breath, went into the kitchen, and tried the extension. Once again, he had no success. The reason, of course, was that this being the end of the world, all the people who were supposed to answer the phones were dead. Imagine being swept away by a tidal wave, if that helps which is exactly what happened to more than 3,000 people during a storm in Pakistan in 1960. Not that this is literally what happened to the operators who would have taken Wyndham's 911 call, you understand, but more about what really happened to them later. The important thing is that one moment they had been alive, the next they were dead, like Wyndham's wife. Wyndham gave up on the phone. He went back into the bedroom. He performed a fumbling version of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on his wife for 15 minutes or so, and he gave that up too. He walked into his daughter's bedroom. She was 12, and her name was Ellen. He found her lying on her back, her mouth slightly agape. He reached down to shake her. He was going to tell her that something terrible had happened, that her mother had died, but he found that something terrible had happened to her as well. The same terrible thing, in fact. Wyndham panicked. He raced outside where the first hint of red had begun to bleed up over the horizon. His neighbor's automatic irrigation system was on, the heads wicking in the silence as he squinted across the lawn, when he felt the spray like a cool hand against his face. Then, chilled, he was standing on his neighbor's stoop, hammering the door with both fists, screaming. After a time, he didn't know how long, a dreadful calm settled over him. There was no sound but the sound of the sprinklers throwing glittering arcs of spray into the halo of the street light on the corner. Wyndham swallowed. Then he did something he could not have imagined doing even 20 minutes ago. He bent over, fished the key from its hiding place between the bricks, and let himself inside his neighbor's house. The neighbor's cat slipped past him, mewing querulously. When he had already reached down to retrieve it, when he noticed the smell, an unpleasant, faintly organic funk. Not spoiled milk, either. And not feet. Something worse. Soiled diapers or a clogged toilet. When he straightened, uh, straightened, the cat forgotten. Herm, he called. Robin? No answer. Inside, Wyndham picked up the phone and dialed 911. He listened to it ring for a long time. Then, without bothering to turn it off, Wyndham dropped the phone to the floor. He made his way through the silent house, snapping on lights. At the door to the master bedroom, he hesitated. The odor? It was unmistakable now. A mingled stench of urine and feces, of all the body's muscles relaxing at once, it was stronger here. When he spoke again, whispering, really, Herm... Robin? He no longer expected an answer. Wyndham turned on the light. Robin and Herm were shapes in the bed, unmoving. Stepping closer, Wyndham stared down at them. A fleeting series of images cascaded through his mind. Images of, of, images of Herm and Robin working the grill at the neighborhood block party or puttering in their vegetable garden. They'd had a knack for tomatoes, Robin and Herm. Wyndham's wife had always loved their tomatoes. Something caught in Wyndham's throat. He went away for a while then. The world just grayed out on him. When he came back, Wyndham found himself in the living room standing in front of Robin and Herm's television. He turned it on and cycled through the channels, but there was nothing on. Literally nothing. Snow, that's all. Seventy-five channels of snow. The end of the world had always been televised in Wyndham's experience. The fact that it wasn't being televised now suggested that it really was the end of the world. This is not to suggest that television validates human experience of the end of the world, or indeed of anything else for that matter. You could ask the people of Pompeii, if most of them hadn't died on a volcano eruption in 79 AD, nearly two millennia before television. When Vesuvius erupted, sending lava thundering down the mountainside at four minute, miles a minute, some 16,000 people perished. By some freakish geological quirk, some of them, their shells anyway, were preserved, frozen inside casts of volcanic, volcanic ash. Their arms are outstretched in pleas for mercy, their faces frozen in horror. For a fee, you can visit them today. 
Here's one of my favorite end of the world scenarios, by the way. Carnivorous plants. Wyndham got in his car and went looking for assistance. A functioning telephone or television, a helpful passerby. He found instead more non-functioning telephones and televisions and, of course, more non-functioning people. Lots of those. They had to look harder for them than you might have expected. They weren't scattered in the streets or dead at the wheels of their cars in a massive traffic jam. The Wyndham supposed that might have been the case somewhere in Europe with a catastrophe, whatever it was, fallen square in the middle of the morning rush. Here, however, it seemed to have caught most folks at home in bed. As a result, the roads were more than usually passable. At a loss, numb really, Wyndham drove to work. He might have been in shock by then. He'd gotten accustomed to the smell anyway, and the corpses of the night shift, men and women he'd known for 16 years in some cases, didn't shake him as much. What did shake him was the sight of all the packages in the sorting area. He was struck suddenly by the fact that none of them would ever be delivered. So Wyndham loaded his truck and went out on his route. He wasn't sure why he did it. Maybe because he'd read at a movie once in which a post-apocalyptic drifter scavenges a U.S. postal uniform, manages to re-establish Western civilization, but not the bad old ways, by assuming the postman's appointed rounds. The futility of Wyndham's own efforts quickly became evident, however. He gave it up when he found that even Monica, as he more often thought of her, the home shopping network lady, was no longer in the business of receiving packages. Wyndham found her face down on the kitchen floor, clutching a shattered coffee mug in one hand. In death, she had neither a pretty face nor a nice personality. She did have that same ripe, unpleasant odor, however. In spite of it, Wyndham stood looking down at her for the longest time. He couldn't seem to look away. When he finally did look away, Wyndham went back to the living room where he had once watched as nearly 3,000 people died and opened her package himself. When it came to UPS rules, the home shopping network lady's living room was turning out to be something of a post-apocalyptic zone in its own right. Wyndham tore the mailing tape off and dropped it on the floor. He opened the box. Inside, wrapped safely in three layers of bubble wrap, he found a porcelain statue of Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, died August 16, 1977, while sitting on the toilet. An autopsy revealed that he'd ingested an, an impressive cocktail of prescription drugs, including codeine, methinamate, and uh, various barbiturates. Doctors also found trace elements of Valium, Demerol, and other pharmaceuticals in his veins. For a time, Wyndham, Wyndham comforted himself with the illusion that the end of the world had been a local phenomenon. He sat in his truck outside the home shopping network lady's house and awaited rescue. The sound of sirens or approaching choppers, whatever. He fell asleep, creating the porcelain statue of Elvis. He woke up at dawn, stiff from sleeping in the truck, to find a stray dog nosing around outside. Clearly, rescue would not be forthcoming. Wyndham chased off the dog and placed Elvis gently on the sidewalk. Then he drove off, heading out of the city. Periodically, he stopped, each time confirming what he had already known the minute he touched his dead wife's face. The end of the world was upon him. He found nothing but non-functioning telephones, non-functioning televisions, and non-functioning people. Along the way, he listened to a lot of non-functioning radio stations. You, Black Wyndham, may be curious about the catastrophe that has befallen everyone in the world around him. You may even be wondering why Wyndham has survived. End of the world tales typically make a big deal about such things. But Wyndham's curiosity will never be satisfied. Unfortunately, neither will yours. Shit happens. It's the end of the world, after all. The dinosaurs never discovered what caused their extinction, either. At this writing, however, most scientists agree that the dinosaurs met their fate when an asteroid nine miles wide plowed into the Earth just south of the Yucatan Peninsula, triggering gigantic tsunamis, hurricane-force winds, worldwide forest fires, and a flurry of volcanic activity. The crater is still there. It's 120 miles wide and more than a mile deep. But the dinosaurs, along with 75% of the other species then alive, are gone. Many of them died in the impact, vaporized in the explosion. Those that survived the initial cataclysm would have perished soon after as acid, acid rain poisoned the world's water and dust obscured the sun, plunging the planet into a years-long winter. For what it's worth, this impact was merely the most dramatic in a long series of mass extinctions. They occur in the fossil record at roughly 30 million year intervals. Some scientists have linked these intervals to the solar system's periodic journey through the galactic plane, which dislodges millions of comets from the Oort cloud beyond Pluto, raining them down on Earth. This theory, still contested, 
was called the Shiva Hypothesis, in honor of the Hindu god of destruction. The inhabitants of Lisbon would have appreciated the allusion on November 1, 1755, when the city was struck by an earthquake measuring 8.5 on the Richter scale. The tremor leveled, leveled more than 12,000 homes and ignited a fire that burned for six days. More than 60,000 people perished. Wyndham could have filled the gas tank in his truck. There were gas stations at just about every exit along the highway, and they seemed to be functioning well enough. He didn't bother, though. When the truck ran out of gas, he just pulled to the side of the road, hopped down, struck off across the fields. When it started getting dark, this was before he had launched himself on the study of just how it is night falls, he took shelter in the nearest house. It was a nice place, a two-story brick house set well back from the country road he was by then walking on. It had some big trees in the front yard. In the back, a shaded lawn sloped down to the kind of woods you see in movies, not often in real life. Enormous old trees with generous leaf-carpeted avenues. It's the kind of place his wife would have loved. He regretted having to break a window to get inside. But there it was. It was the end of the world. He had to have a place to sleep. What else could he do? Wyndham hadn't planned to stay there, but when he woke up the next morning, he couldn't think of anywhere to go. He found two non-functional old people in one upstairs bedroom, tried to do for them what he had not been able to do for his wife and daughter. Using a spade from the garage, he started digging a grave in the front yard. After an hour or so, his hands began to blister and crack. His muscles, soft from sitting behind the wheel of a UPS truck for all those years, rebelled. He rested for a while, then he loaded the old people into the car he found parked in the garage, slate blue Volvo station wagon with 37,312 miles on the odometer. He drove them a mile or two down the road, pulled over, and laid them out side by side in a grove of beech trees. He tried to say some words over them before he left. His wife would have wanted him to, but he couldn't think of anything appropriate, so he finally gave it up and went back to the house. It wouldn't have made much difference. Though Wyndham didn't know it, the old people were lapsed Jews. According to the faith Wyndham shared with his wife, they were doomed to burn in hell for all eternity anyway. Both of them were first-generation immigrants. Most of their families had already been burned up in ovens at Dachau and Buchenwald. Burning wouldn't have been anything new for them. Speaking of fires, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City burned on March 25, 1911. 146 people died. Many of them might have survived, but the factory's owners had locked the exits to prevent theft. Rome burned, too. It is said that Nero fiddled. Back at the house, Wyndham washed up and made himself a drink from the liquor cabinet he found in the kitchen. He'd never been much of a drinker before the world ended, but he didn't see any reason not to give it a try now. His experiment proved such a success that he began sitting out on the porch nights, drinking gin and watching the sky. One night, he thought he saw a plane, lights blinking as it, as it arced high overhead. Later, sober, he concluded it must have been a satellite still whipping around the planet, beaming down to Lemmer Tree, to empty listening stations and abandoned command posts. A day or two later, the power went out, and a few days after that, Wyndham ran out of liquor. Using the Volvo, he set off in search of a town. Characters in End of the World stories commonly drive vehicles of two types. The jaded sophisticates tend to drive souped-up sports cars, often racing them along the Australian coastline, because what else do they have to live for? Everyone else drives rugged SUVs. Since the 1991 Persian Gulf War, in which some 23,000 people died, most of them Iraqi conscripts killed by American smart bombs, military-style Humvees have been especially coveted. Wyndham, however, found the Volvo entirely adequate to his needs. No one shot at him. He was not assaulted by a roving pack of feral dogs. He found a town after only 15 minutes on the road. He didn't see any evidence of looting. Everybody was too dead to loot. That's the way it is at the end of the world. On the way, Wyndham passed a sporting, goods, a sporting goods store where he did not stop to stock up on weapons or survival equipment. He passed numerous, numerous abandoned vehicles, but he did not stop to siphon off some gas. He did stop at the liquor store where he smashed a window with a rock and helped himself to several cases of gin, whiskey, and vodka. He also stopped at the grocery store where he found the reeking bodies of the night crew sprawled out beside carts of supplies that would never make it onto the shelves. Holding a handkerchief over his nose, Wyndham looked, loaded up on tonic water and a variety of other mixes. He also got some canned goods. He didn't feel any imperative to stock up beyond his immediate needs. He ignored the bottled water. In the book section, he did pick up a bartender's guide. 
Some end of the world stories present us with two post-apocalypse survivors, one male and one female. These two survivors take it upon themselves to repopulate the earth, part of their larger effort to reestablish Western civilization without the bad old ways. Their names are always artfully withheld until the end of the story, at which point they're invariably revealed to be Adam and Eve. The truth is, almost all end of the world stories are at some level Adam and Eve stories, maybe why they enjoy such popularity. In the interest of total disclosure, I will admit that in fallow periods of my own sexual life, and the last these periods have been more frequent than I care to admit, I've often found Adam and Eve post-Holocaust fantasy strangely comforting. Being the only man alive significantly reduces the potential for rejection, in my view, and it cuts performance anxiety practically to nothing. There's a woman in this story, too. Don't get your hopes up. By this time, Wyndham has been living in the brick house for almost two weeks. He sleeps in the old couple's bedroom, and he sleeps pretty well, but maybe that's the gin. Some mornings he wakes up disoriented, wondering where his wife is and how he came to be in such a strange place. Other mornings he wakes up feeling like he dreamed everything else, and this has always been his bedroom. One day, though, he wakes up early to gray pre-dawn light. Someone is moving around downstairs. Wyndham's curious, but he's not afraid. He doesn't wish he'd stopped at the sporting goods store and gotten a gun. Wyndham has never shot a gun in his life. If he did shoot someone, even a post-apocalyptic punk with cannibalism on his mind, he'd probably have a breakdown. Wyndham doesn't try to disguise his presence as, go as he goes downstairs. There's a woman in the living room. She's not bad looking, this woman. Blonde in a washed out kind of way, trim and young, 25, 30 at the most. She doesn't look extremely clean and she doesn't smell much better, but hygiene hasn't been uppermost on Wyndham's mind lately either. Who is he to judge? I was looking for a place to sleep, the woman says. There's a spare bedroom upstairs, Wyndham tells her. The next morning, it's really almost noon, but Wyndham has gotten into the habit of sleeping late. They eat breakfast together, a Pop-Tart for the woman, a bowl of dry Cheerios for Wyndham. They compare notes. We don't need to get into that. It's the end of the world, and the woman doesn't know how it happened any more than Wyndham does, or you do, or anybody ever does. She does most of the talking, though. Wyndham's never been much of a talker, even at the best of times. Um, <clears throat> he doesn't ask her to stay. He doesn't ask her to leave doesn't ask her much of anything. That's how it goes all day. Sometimes the whole sex thing causes the end of the world. In fact, if you'll permit me to reference Adam and Eve just one more time, sex and death have been connected to the end of the world ever since, well, the beginning of the world. Eve, despite warnings to the contrary, eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and realizes she's naked, that is a sexual being. Then she introduces Adam to the idea by giving him a bite of the fruit. God punishes Adam and Eve for their transgression by kicking them out of paradise and introducing death into the world. And there you have it. In the first apocalypse, Eros and Thanatos all tied up in one neat little bundle. It's all Eve's fault. No wonder feminists don't like that story. It's a pretty corrosive view of female sexuality when you think about it. Coincidentally, perhaps one of my favorite end of the war stories involves some astronauts who fall into a time warp. When they get out, they learn that all the men are dead. The women have done pretty well for themselves in the meantime. They no longer need men to reproduce, and they've set up a society that seems to work okay without men. Better, in fact, than our messy two-sex societies ever have. But do the men stay out of it? They do not. They're men, after all. They're driven by their need for sexual dominance. It's genetically encoded, so to speak. It's not long before they're trying to turn this Eden into another fallen world. It's sex that does it. It's violent male sex, rape actually. In other words, sex that's more about the violence than the sex. Certainly nothing to do with love. Which when you think about it, it's pretty, a pretty corrosive view of male sexuality. The more things change, the more they stay the same, I guess. Wyndham though. <clears throat> Wyndham heads out on the porch around three. He's got some tonic. He's got some gin. It's what he does now. He doesn't know where the woman is, doesn't have strong feelings on the issue either way. He's been sitting there for hours when she joins him. Wyndham doesn't know what time it is, but the air has that hazy underwater quality that comes around twilight. Darkness is starting to pool under the trees. The crickets are tuning up. It's so peaceful that for a moment Wyndham can almost forget that it's the end of the world. And the screen door claps shut behind the woman. Wyndham can tell right away that she's done something to herself, 
but he couldn't tell you for sure what it is. The magic women do, he guesses. His wife used to do it too. She always looked good to him, but sometimes she looked just flat out amazing. Some powder, a little blush, lipstick, you know. He appreciates the effort, he does. He's flattered even. He's an attractive woman, intelligent too. The truth is though, he's just not interested. She sits beside him and all the time she's talking, though she doesn't say it in so many words, what she's talking about is repopulating the world and reestablishing Western civilization. She's talking about duty. She's talking about it because that's what you're supposed to talk about at times like this. Underneath that is sex. Underneath that, way down, is loneliness. He has some sympathy for that, Wyndham does. After a while, she touches Wyndham. He's got nothing. He might as well be dead down there. What's wrong with you, she says. Wyndham doesn't know how to answer her. He doesn't know how to tell her that the end of the world isn't about any of that stuff. The end of the world is about something else. He doesn't have a word for it. So anyway, Wyndham's wife. She has another book on her nightstand, too. She doesn't read it every night, only on Sundays. But the week before the end of the world, the story she was reading was the story of Job. You know the story, right? It goes like this. God and Satan, the adversary anyway, is probably the better translation, make a wager. You want to see just how much shit God's most faithful servant will eat before he's, he renounces his faith. The servant's name is Job. So they make the wager. God starts feeding Job shit, takes his riches, takes his cattle, takes his health, deprives him of his friends, on and on. Finally, this is the part that always gets to Wyndham, God takes Job's children. Let me clarify, in this, in this context, takes should be read as kills. You with me on this? Like Krakatoa, a volcanic island that used to exist between Java and Sumatra. On August 27, 1883, Krakatoa exploded spewing ash 50 miles into the sky, vomiting up five cubic miles of rock. The concussion was heard 3,000 miles away. It created tsunamis towering 125 feet in the air. Imagine all that water crashing down on the flimsy villages that lined the shores of Java and Sumatra. 30,000 people died. Every single one of them had a name. Job's kids, dead. Just like 30,000 nameless Javanese, as for Job, he keeps shoveling down the shit. He will not renounce God. He keeps the faith. And he's rewarded. God gives him back his riches, his cattle. God restores his health and sends him friends. God replaces his kids. Pay attention. Word choice is important in an end of the world story. I said replaces, not restores. The other kids, they stay dead, gone, non-functioning, erased forever from the earth just like the dinosaurs and the 12 million undesirables incinerated by the Nazis, the 500,000 slaughtered in Rwanda, the 1.7 million murdered in Cambodia, and the 60 million immolated in the Middle Passage. That merry prankster God, that jokester. That's what the end of the world is about, Wyndham wants to say. The rest is just details. By this point, the woman, you want her to have a name? She deserves one, don't you think? Has started to weep softly. Wyndham gets to his feet and goes into the dark kitchen for another glass. When he comes back out to the porch, he makes a gin and tonic. He sits beside her and presses the cool glass upon her. It's all he knows to do. Here, he says, drink this. It'll help.